SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. I'd like to introduce our speaker, John Doan. He's the Dean of Health Sciences at the university. He's a very good friend of mine. He, uh, he's a good pronghorn supporter. He was the uh, chair of uh, Lethbridge Sports Hall of Fame for several years. And uh, he's, uh, he knows a lot about things, not just at the university. He's a universally uh, knowledgeable person. And I'd like you to give him a warm welcome. He's going to come and speak to us now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to see such a, a full crowd, and thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks to uh, Knut as well for a, a glowing introduction there, that uh, uh, big shoes to fill, but I, I will do my best here. As Knut said, my name is John Doan. I'm the Dean of Health Sciences at the University of Lethbridge, and, and really happy to talk to you today about a, mur a rural medical education training center in Lethbridge. And as you can see the byline here, what are the benefits and what are the challenges? So talk to you a little bit mm -hmm. about what we're up to in this area. Like any researcher, though, or any academic, I need to start with a discussion of my own research, right? We need to get ourselves out there a little bit. And I'm very excited to uh, talk a little bit about a, a presentation that was recently accepted for an uh, upcoming national conference in Edmonton. And this is some of my uh, work looking at people living with Parkinson's disease. And little hard to read there maybe, but the title here is Exercise Modulates Facial Expression Amongst People Living with Parkinson's Disease. And so let's talk about the work first. This may sound like a, a somewhat minor finding or a, 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 a sidelight for you, but in fact the, the uh, struggles that some people living with Parkinson have with generating um, expressive facial emotions is, is quite detrimental. Right? It often leads to a real vicious cycle of um, social resistance and failure to thrive because without being able to make those expressions, other people have a hard way reading uh, what that patient's mood and, and, and experience is and understanding how to interact with them. So soon they can tend to stop interacting with other generations, colleagues, and in social spaces like that. What's really exciting for us in the process of this paper is that we discovered uh, through some Zoom recordings and through some of our Parkinson's exercise, right now we're looking at boxing as exercise for people living with Parkinson's disease, that we were able to change these facial expressions. We saw improved positive emotions or, or, or the, the visual representation of improved positive emotions amongst our people living with Parkinson's when they were uh, experiencing their boxing exercise compared to other activities or uh, non-Parkinson controls. It's a really exciting finding for us and fairly novel actually inside the world of uh, movement disorder research. What's equally exciting and, and, and leads me to, sorry about that, the, the, the genesis of my talk today is uh, along the author list here. So Knut already gave me uh, more than enough glow up about uh, my participation here, but I'll just let you know I moved to Lethbridge in 2001 uh, to do my PhD here at the university in the then very new uh, behavioral neuroscience program, uh, new for a PhD program, uh, and have stayed ever since. I was, uh, in 2005, I started a faculty position in the Department of Kinesiology, and I've been here since. My co-author here, Dr. Natalie De Bruin, uh, had a similar story. She arrived in Lethbridge in the mid-2000s, having completed an undergraduate degree in chemistry in the UK, with the interest of doing an undergrad in kinesiology and then becoming a physiotherapist. She enjoyed her experience at University of Lethbridge and in the world of neuroscience so much. She stayed and did a master's degree, then a PhD degree, and now Dr. De Bruin is one of the more senior instructors in our Department of Kinesiology and a, 
a really valuable colleague, and in fact, a, a world-renowned expert on uh, music as stimulus for people living with Parkinson's disease. My other co-author here may be well known to this crowd as well, Ian Wisha arrived in Lethbridge in the mid 70s, again with the intention of spending a little time at U of L learning his trade and then moving on, in his words at the time, to a bigger university. Uh, Wisha has been at the U of L since the mid 70s and he's still with us, active, publishing, supervising students and teaching classes and he's, he's a real valued mentor to me. And again, like De Bruyne, Dr. De Bruyne, a world renowned expert in the world of many things neuroscience. The catch here in the group, right, is our lead author, Jean Vimette. And I want to be careful here and say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not looking to set uh, Jean Vimette up as, as uh, a problem in the system here, merely as an example, right? Jean Vimette is a fantastic undergraduate student at the U of L. Right. She spent some time working in my lab on this project. She spent time working with my good colleague, Dr. Robin Gibb, looking at cannabinoids uh, and its influence on motor function. Uh, she was an outstanding student who did such great things as being a shining graduate and a gold medal recipient uh, for her class at spring 2021 convocation. And then she left. And in fall 2021, Jean V started med school at University of Alberta. And happy to report, she just successfully completed third year. She's doing great things at University of Alberta and we're really happy about what she's accomplished. But there's a difference here between these groups, right? And the difference is that Drs. Wisha, De Bruyne, and myself had a chance to train regional and then stay regional. What Jean V wanted to do, what she wanted to learn, and where she wanted to go, she could not access or train to do in Lethbridge, right? And our rural medical education program is really intended to change that situation. And in fact, University of Lethbridge itself was intended to change that situation, right? When the university was developed in the late 60s, when it opened on its west side campus, a photo at the top here from fall 1971, uh, the intention was to deliver this kind of local education and training. Right? And in fact, there were many people, um, many maybe a little bit rich, but there were people at the time who thought that from the get-go, University of Lethbridge would have med school, law school, engineering, all those pieces. Right? Certainly, people in the community anticipated a shrunken down University of Alberta. Right? But that was not the place where we started. We started at our liberal education roots. We started with a strong focus on uh, the social sciences, on some of our science programs, on our phys ed work and our athletics. Right? And we're now growing into this place, again, with the interest of training people locally. It matches well with a current challenge that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and these are stats provided by Alberta Health Services and the government of Alberta. 140 family doctors left Alberta in 2022, 24 of those left Lethbridge itself. In 2023, residency placements, 21 family medicine residencies at UC went initially unfilled. They did eventually fill for the most part, but initially 21 places for resident medical students right, at UC in the family medicine area did not get filled. And the government of Alberta estimates that up to 3,000 family physicians will be required to meet current needs plus growth, projected growth, right, in the near future. Right? And we know that the critical shortage for these family physicians is in rural centers. In late 2022 then, with armed with this information, and I will say armed with uh, strong encouragement from the post-secondary sector, including University of Lethbridge and community members in Lethbridge as well. Right? The then Minister of Advanced Education, um, Dr. Nicolades, uh, inside their mandate letter received the information that they were to work with Alberta's established medical schools, right? so U of C and U of A, to examine ways to increase the number of physicians trained in Alberta, particularly in rural areas, by partnering with regional post-secondary institutions, right? specifically ourselves and Northwestern Polytechnic. 
again, I'll go back to my academic and research roots. We took this information inside the mandate letter as our cue to increase our efforts in this area. So we moved very quickly into researching the world, and not that we hadn't been in the past, but ex furthering our research in the world of distributed medical education models. So this uh, satellite campus model where an accredited medical school would set up or would work with a uh, remote campus to deliver medical education in that location. There is a wide range of research on this topic and it really is centered in Canada and Australia, which gives us a great foundation to work from. There are also multiple working models in Canada as well. And I'm going to point to three here that we've had a chance to visit, investigate closely, work with their leadership, work with their staff, work with their students to understand what works well there, what doesn't, and what it is we can bring to Lethbridge. So UBC has four satellite campuses to med school, UNBC and Prince George, UBCO and Kelowna. Uh, they have a campus at UVic, and they have a campus in the lower mainland in Surrey. Mac has a pair of campuses, one at Brock University in the Niagara region, one uh, in Waterloo, not on Waterloo campus, but in Waterloo. Uh, and University of Western Ontario has a satellite campus in Windsor. And when, again, we've had a chance to work with all of these groups to understand what went well, what didn't, what can we start to build in to make ourselves as successful as possible. That was parallel then, so I showed the uh, November 2022 mandate letter. That was parallel then with a funding announcement from the government in January 2023, uh, funding for these four institutions to start to explore the feasibility of distributed medical education inside their spaces, right? How would that look? So again, the groups working together here are U of L, U of C, Northwestern Polytechnic and Grand Prairie and the University of Alberta. At the same time, right, to control this process and to uh, organize this collective activity, the, we've set up a provincial uh, distributed medical edu education planning group, and you can see the uh, authorities here, deans and vice deans from U of A, U of C, provost and dean from Northwestern Polytechnic, and provost designate and associate dean from University of Lethbridge. And that group, along with uh, local shareholders at all four institutions and in all four communities, worked with PricewaterhouseCooper and a consultant brought in from that group to do some of the early consultation and collaborative work here. Right? And really to generate this vision about a distributed medical education program that would use these regional medical campuses and, and connect with a partner who had an accredited medical program in some sort of collaborative governance a network of regional and rural preceptors, so people who would supervise clinical opportunities and residencies as well to provide that teaching expertise. And then in Grand Prairie and uh, Lethbridge, an interprofessional training clinic as well, a group of established right, and active physicians and allied health right, who would give us a base for some of our education on campus, some of our clinical experiences, and who also would bring then their health practice to, in this case, Southern Alberta. Uh, we wanted to get a little deeper into things here, so we moved from Price Waterhouse Cooper to a standalone consultant, wonderful um, person who's really rolled his sleeves up, sleeves up named Doug Blackie. And again, maybe, well, not maybe, definitely a little tough to read from where you are, but uh, Blackie has helped us work through uh, on-the-ground consulting, uh, at the, in the city of Lethbridge, city of Medicine Hat, Lethbridge County, Carson County, Coots area, Milk River, and Pincher Creek, right, where we've had a chance to meet with community members, linked economic and business sectors, healthcare providers, our university and educational participants as well. So here we would roll in Lethbridge College and Medicine Hat College as part of our discussions, right? policymakers in those areas, as well as administrators in Alberta Health, uh, South Zone and, and uh, Alberta Health, Indigenous Health and Diversity. Mm -hmm. And so Blackie's work here then in these consultations and with almost 4,000 kilometers traveled, uh, a multitude of people worked with, physicians interviewed, was to really set us up with some recommendations for how were we going to be successful in this process. Mm -hmm. One of the stops we made on the trip here uh, was at the University of Calgary Cummings School of Medicine distributed learning 
for all of it. Here you can see uh, Doug in the middle, myself in the background, and my colleague, Dr. Trushar Patel, in the foreground here. And this slide was a reminder for me that Trushar, who's in Montreal right now, is going to call in a little bit shortly in case there's any questions that we can deal with. So if you see me answering the phone, that's to attend to my friend Trushar. And so in this group then, we're working with rural preceptors, so doctors in rural areas who supervise residencies, often uh, longer term residency. So instead of these short clinical experiences, uh, one in part of the University of Calgary model are longitudinal experiences where the students can, or the, the student doctors can come to an area for an extended period, really uh, get both immersed in the community, but also get immersed in that specific healthcare unit and that delivery, and then have a chance through that family physician model to see a number of different issues, to experience a number of different learning opportunities inside that single longitudinal placement. So here we're uh, doing a workshop asking that group about what they would like to see from this program, how they would like students to come to them, what they think students would leave them knowing and having as well. And we had some really interesting inputs there. So recommendations from Doug here then, right? So within the accreditation parameters, knowing that we're working with accredited curriculum from U of C, start to develop here locally a distinct and innovative rural medical education program right? that really brings in that rural learning and living experience and indigenous ways of knowing, right? making those foundational to what we want to include inside this accredited curriculum, what we want to deliver for students at the University of Lethbridge and in the Southern Alberta community. Our, our next action here is to recruit a regional leader to really galvanize the vision and focus there of the Southern Alberta medical program, right? to develop a, a collaborative governance model that we'll use. Again, one of the challenges we could point to or I could suggest here would be working with a partner institution in the University of Calgary, a partner institution of a different size, a different space, a different level of operation, and understanding how are we going to collaborate evenly. And then at the provincial level, how will we do this similar to, but distinct from the U of A Grand Prairie model as well? Right? And what are important about those distinctions and how will we uh, maintain them? Right? And then uh, last suggestion here then, a recommendation from the, the initial Blackie uh, consulting activity was for the two schools to take leadership roles working with local and provincial level healthcare providers, right? To start to talk about what are the issues, right? That brought this to the forefront. What is it along with high quality education and great outcomes, what is it we're trying to generate inside this program? And are there things inside Alberta Health Services at large? Are there things inside HS South Zone? Are there things inside the community that we can also start to build in here to make this as successful as possible? We, we work quickly through these activities. I only have us into summer 2023 here, which is actually when I took on the role of Dean as well. Before that, I had been a professor in kinesiology. Um, but in 2023, the new Minister of Advanced Education, uh, Rajan Swani, uh, in their mandate letter, received a reinforcement of what it is we're trying to do here. So again, continued commitment from the provincial government to continue to work to establish medical schools in these two rural regional centers. And so, reinforced by that continued importance from the provincial government, well, here's Trisha right here. Hello? Hello, Dr. Patel. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. We're just in the presentation, but we're ready for you to jump in with questions when they come up. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, no <laughs> So the, the Southern Alberta Medical Program Working Group then was established by that provincial distributed medical education group to really start to build and organize those specific pieces here in Lethbridge and in the Southern Alberta region. Right? And you can see the, the, um, the, the mandate or the guidelines here. It's really about defining that pathway for medical training in Southern Alberta, understanding how students will come in, what they'll experience, and what infrastructure we need to support that and make it highly successful. 
the group recommends policy and steering ideas, right, or direction to that provincial steering committee who then can share them with the other dyad, U of A and Grand Prairie or Northwestern, right, and can also share theirs with us and start to think about making these parallelly successful. Right? And again, inside the SAMP group, and we saw from the uh, Blackie recommendations along with the Price Waterhouse recommendations, it's this consistent at attention to recruit and retain students from the area, right? Can we find, can we make access, can we break down barriers for rural and indigenous students to be part of this medical education program in Southern Alberta? And indeed, that's the last part on the arrow. When I talked about the uh, exercise modulation study and my colleagues, uh, De Bruin and Wishaw and our, our wonderful student, Jean Vimetta, we said, you know, this is about the opportunity to train regionally and then stay regionally or the inopportunity in the Meta example, right? But it's important to identify earlier on that curve is the opportunity to recruit regionally as well. Are there ways, are there um, uh, parts we can bring to the program that really will both attract and enable students from the area, right, to become trainees in the area and then to stay as professionals in the area. So there's two different uh, levels of involvement. Well, there's one level of involvement with the Southern Alberta Medical Program Working Group. There's two different levels of responsibility. We have voting members, right? so three reps from the University of Lethbridge, three reps from the University of Calgary. Both of those groups would include one student uh, from those areas. We have representatives from AHS, the medical community here in Lethbridge and region, cities of Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, and Pincher Creek, uh, and local indigenous community members who are working in indigenous health. There are also resource, so non-voting members with the SAMP group. Many of them are post-secondary administrators at both U of L and U of C, uh, with experience in delivering academic programming and accredited medical programming specifically. Additional clinicians from the Southern Alberta region, and bring in some of our parallels at U of L, things like facilities, student services. How will we find space for these students? What will those spaces need to look like? Physical spaces. What will they need to look like? What sort of mental health, physical health, access supports, chance to participate in athletics? All sort of things will these students need that we'll need to bring in too. Sounds a little bit dry when you set it up as terms of reference. So I thought it was important to show you this group, right? So last week we had a chance to get together as part of the Memorandum of Understanding uh, signing at the University of Lethbridge, and here is the bulk of our Southern Alberta Medical Program group. A, a great collection of expert in their areas, highly invested. We meet at seven in the morning once a month, so you know these people are invested to get involved, and, and we've really had a chance to really shape uh, the start of a fantastic and fascinating program. I'm really thankful that uh, Everyone's had a chance to participate in that way. So where are we in this process? Uh, I think my take home message for you today is that we are in progress. We have started to do this. And there's four things that we're actively doing right now. Right? We are uh, continuing to advocate for provincial funding. Right? What has been provided is a fantastic place to start and we will continue to work with the provincial government to say, we need to support this initiative. We need to support the other forms of learning that contribute to this initiative, our liberal education um, parallels and contributions to the University of Lethbridge, our full multidisciplinary program that can be part of the support here uh, and all of our needs there. Right. We've definitely started to look at the operational infrastructure considerations for this. Right. We, including my, my uh, happy participation here today, but a lot of our activities right now are about establishing support in the community, knowledgeable support, right? interested support, philanthropic support where we can. We're really interested in connecting this to the community. And we've had a chance to develop an initial MOU uh, with the University of Calgary and sign that at U of L last week. And here's a photo from the signing, right? And the exciting side note to the signing is uh, on the left is provost from the University of Calgary, Dr. Penny Werthner. Werthner was longtime dean of kinesiology at U of C, and she's an a expert sports psychologist. Right? On the right is provost from University of Lethbridge, uh, Michelle Helstein. 
Helstein was longtime chair of the Department of Kinesiology at the University of Lethbridge, and she's an expert sports sociologist as well and a, a well-renowned researcher. So we sometimes get a little bit of worry at UofL that kinesiologists are taking over the world. I have no worry about that. Great people to take over the world and two great people here to lead our initiative for sure. What are the benefits of doing this at University of Lethbridge? And we, we have not had to do an exhaustive sales job here. I think the benefits are clear, but that it is a little bit of a pat on the back or it is a little bit heartwarming to think about them every once in a while. One of the benefits of doing this at the U of L is that we're a comprehensive university. We're heavily involved in research at the U of L, but we do this out of a rural regional context. Right? and with knowledge and access and with students who come from rural spaces and have a chance to return to those rural places as well. Right? As I said, we're a leading institution in delivering research and teaching opportunities. We, have, we, we, we hit far above our weight in terms of things like Canada Research Chair, uh, research productivities, and, and, and the, the expertise amongst our faculty. And that's a great space to get into when you want to bring in something that's going to have a strong research connection like a medical school. We have a long-standing relationship with the community. Right? It really was a community idea that sprang U of L. We are many U of L U of L faculty and administrators are heavily active in community activities, and that includes activities amongst our indigenous community. Just this year, we've had the fortune to start uh, one of the largest Blackfoot-led research projects, along with the Blood Tribe Department of Health, Health looking at asset mapping inside. Um, uh, indigenous regions, both so uh, indigenous community and uh, urban indigenous spaces as well, to start to understand what health opportunities and health challenges look like there. And we have wonderful connections with these communities that we continue to uh, attend to, work on, and deliver through. We have the existing administrative infrastructure to build support for such program. We are a post-secondary institution. We know how to operate the administrative pieces that allow students to be successful, to help students when they have challenges, to attract students, to graduate students. Right? We have those pieces in place, a great place to start. And uh, fortunate to us, since 2019, we also have a physical infrastructure ready to support this programming. When we built and moved into the Science Commons, we left uh, effectively uh, intact and in great shape, but largely unused, the Canadian Center for Behavioral Neuroscience, now called the Community Center for Wellness Building. And the, the added benefit of this building as we start to go through those renos and processes that will turn this into a medical school, is it has a uh, high-grade MRI on one end as well. So we're also seeing connections now with community partners and private businesses that we've brought in or attracted to campus about how we may get some teaching, learning, research, uh, and, and um, healthcare use out of that same space. We're really excited to start the work on moving this project into our uh, CCW building. Last then, we're gonna talk about the benefits of U of L, right? but important and certainly important for this group, our talk about the benefits for both U of L and the Southern Alberta community as well. Right? And they're manifold, right? Obviously, you know, our hope through this recruit, train, stay model for expertise is that we'll have improved healthcare access and quality in Lethbridge and Southern Alberta. All the research shows that this model works. When you recruit and train locally, people stay locally. Right? And the, our chance to do this with uh, Southern Alberta students, right, or with an, a, an access avenue for Southern Alberta students is gonna be a great place to start. This being an important educational opportunity for University of Lethbridge undergraduates. I raved about kinesiology before, but I have to talk about its, not its dark side, but one of our challenges there too. We do have a lot of students who want to go on to something in the health professions, whether it's physiotherapy, occupational therapy, med school, speech pathology, all those sorts of things, right? And sometimes we do lose these fantastic students that we've spent time growing and learning and sharing with, and that my colleagues have spent time growing and learning and sharing as well. We lose them to other, it's not lose, I mean, I know that they are moving on and I'm happy for them, but uh, we could have those educational opportunities at University of Lethbridge as well. Uh, I, I won't run through the whole list here, I don't think, but I, it, it is important to identify that we, there are many benefits, we think, for the community, for the institution as we start to bring in this type of Our research expansion will be incredible. Our opportunity to do things like clinical, clinical research trials, to develop really thorough and big interdisciplinary and interinstitution collaborations in the world of healthcare research. 
our chance for innovation and technology transfer, right? These sort of biomed in parallel to uh, health education. Uh, our chance to, in parallel with this, really start to think about public health initiatives and programming as well, right? Well, some medicine uh, continues to operate inside that reactive model, right? Public health and proactive health opportunities are really important for us, and they're, they're really important part of my research as well, and, and for many people, right? having a chance to maintain wellness rather than react to lack of health, right? And with a medical program, we can really start to think about some of those opportunities there. Of course, this puts us in a great place to do community outreach as well. People who are curious about what happens in medical school, people who have an interest in returning to school, right? people who have an interest in doing some non-credit programming that springs up beside the school, uh, would have a chance to engage with their post-secondary institution in that way. And obviously, there's economic impact here as well, right? by attracting learners, by attracting families, by attracting people to southern Alberta. Thanks so much for your attention there to that. As Knut said, I'm very happy to address some questions. And I know my colleague, Dr. Patel, is happy to chime in on questions as well. We're really excited to, to start to talk to the community about this exciting step uh, and, and the places we want to go. So thank you so much. Next week, we speak about, we have a speaker uh, from the university, and we've been talking a lot about our brains lately, and next week is no different. We're talking about the relationship between what you eat and how your brain functions. And two weeks down the road, well, 13 days down the road, on June the 5th, which is a Wednesday, uh, we have uh, David Carpenter come to speak about uh, your pensions and uh, what might happen if we uh, change provider. So without further ado, uh, question period is ready to go. And uh, please, uh, you know, state your name when you get up here and uh, don't make it too long a speech. Just to ask you a question. Thanks, Newt. Ken Sears. Um, and I have to start with a, a fast anecdote. I was in one of the clinics, uh, one of the labs, and it was last month. And I overheard one of the technicians talking to a new client. And they were asking about the client's do doctor, who was also new to the city. And just without even thinking, this clinician said, well, they'll be gone in three years like all the rest of them. And we looked at the numbers you had there. Over a third of the doctors that have left Lethbridge, or left the province, came from Lethbridge. What is there in your view of the way this is going to unfold, not just the making of the doctors, which is what you've normally talked about, how much attention is being paid to keeping those doctors, and particularly keeping them in the small towns and even places the size of Lethbridge? Because from history, they will be gone. And given the that the Alberta government is now unleashing on Alberta Health Services, I do not see any real indication that that is going to improve, and I think it may get worse. So I'd need a, like a comment. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ken, and and sorry that a, a client had to hear that comment from a clinician. Uh, it, it, it's unfair, and and. Um, you know, with, with while it happens, it was it without basis in the specific incident. There are several different models to retain, right? And w I'll speak about the the medical education piece um, because that's you know my area is the post secondary. There is the the requirement for residency, right? We'll provide some funding or we'll allow an avenue to attend med school with the promise that you'll stay in this area for a certain amount of time. I think. 
most jurisdictions find that challenging, right? The, the opportunity to default on it, the administration that's taken to make sure that people follow through on it is challenging. It's not been part of the proposal here. And in fact, I think it would be a little bit secondary or post what we're doing. What we're really attending to, both from looking at the research, from looking at the, what's happened from these distributed medical education sites, and from what we're planning to do here, is this entry point where we say, as part of the application process, we say, tell us about your connection to Southern Alberta, your experience in rural areas, and your interest in continuing in a rural area. Right? We're really going to have a stream for rural applicants to say, here's why, when we're weighing all the different things that you're gonna to use to consider whether or not I should get to med school, here's this piece that's going to be important to us, right? And similar for uh, indigenous applicants and, and other uh, diversity seeking groups are going to find an opportunity to really um, make their interest in staying in the area an important part of consideration of, of entering the program as well. We're also going to, the program will also concentrate on resident, both clinical placements during the three years of undergraduate medical training and residency placements that are in rural spaces in southern Alberta and that are uh, ideally, though I mean there's a little bit of programming for her, but that are longitudinal in nature as well. And again, the research and discussions with our rural health uh, professional practice colleagues around uh, southern Alberta and in fact around Canada when we have a chance to talk to people about that is once you expose learners to that opportunity here's what it can be like inside a family physician practice here's what it can be like inside a, a smaller regional hospital and here's how much experience you can build up on that if you spend a longer amount of time here than that short two-week placement than those shorter residencies people are finding that effective in keeping those people they become they, they started off as part of the community through this rural attestation or this rural pathway. They become part of the community during these longer term residence experiences in rural areas. And now, I, I, th I think it really takes me back to the presentation. Neither Wishaw, nor De Bruin, nor when I look closely at myself, I don't think any of the three of us were planning on uh, staying forever at the University of Lethbridge. I came here as a PhD student, Natalie came here initially as a bachelor's of science student, and wish I came here as a new professor ready to tear things apart, right? But we stayed because we became part of the community, right? And we're gonna try to generate the same thing amongst these students by bringing them from the community, connecting them to the community, and keeping them in the community. Maureen Hawkins, can I ask you two questions? One which is just sort of basic because it's not clear to me, and then an actual question. Is this training going to be medical school plus residencies? See, I'm not clear on that. I know a doctor mm -hmm. has to go through med school mm -hmm. and do a residency. Mm -hmm. And will the residencies be restricted? Will the residencies be restricted to family medicine? Will the medicine uh, be restricted to family medicine, or will there be residencies and specializations? Sure. Thanks, Maureen. Good, good question. Yes, this will be three. Uh, the UC program is three years undergraduate medical education, so the students will be do three years of that uh, problem-based uh, team learning that UC has set in the program. But they'll do that all here. Uh, in Lethbridge and then their clinical placements in the Southern Alberta region, and then two years of residency as well. Uh, they, the, the residency opportunities will be uh, largely family medicine. We, we're not the intention to have uh, specialties from the get-go, um, and, and maybe at no point in time, but they, um, the, the students, I mean, some students will be interested in, in specialty, no doubt about that. That is training above and beyond that two years of residency. But their initial two years of residency will be family medicine in rural region. Yep. Thank you. And then my real question. My understanding is that it's very difficult these days to recruit people in family medicine that they feel it's underpaid and they have too much paperwork and too much office, et cetera. Um, 
and yet that's where we have a really desperate need. How are you going to recruit them? And another problem that I've run across recently is that local people who went to medical school elsewhere find it difficult to get residencies in Canada. Would you be open to, uh, to giving students who trained elsewhere but are from southern Alberta a residency here? Yeah, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, those students who trained at a different school and then were trying to do their residency connected to that school but here, that, that's a little bit out of our purview, right? So the residency matching is a system uh, called CARMS that actually happens at the, the countrywide level. So they, if they wanted to come to rural residencies here, they would have access. They could apply for family medicine, rural residencies or specialties through CARMS like other students would as well. Um, whether, I mean, international education or where they had done that training does start to bring in some challenges, not, not specifically what we can control as well. Your point about family medicine is a great one, right? That, that is the, the, the tone and the conversation around it. There's a, there is a lot of struggle, there is a lot of burnout, there is a lot of, of load and demand, and they, you know, we always like to contrast or look at something else. They like to compare themselves to a specialist. A cardiologist may see 30 patients in a day and, and be well compensated for that because the conversations are shorter and the delivery is, is, is pretty quick. Family medicine doesn't have that same opportunity, right? There's longer conversations or dealing sometimes with multiple members of the family inside one visit. What we've concentrated on, I showed the picture of Trushar and Doug and I at the distributed learning event in Kananaskis that the USC put on. What we've concentrated on in our conversations and what we'll continue to build is the, the uh, preceptors and supervisors who are still very excited about family medicine. And they are out there. There are people who are finding really fantastic experiences and, 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 and great quality of life by being family physicians, right? And our intent then, and we've, we've identified them across Southern Alberta, our intent then is to support those people, to work with them and say, what can we do to help it make sense for you to bring in a resident, right? And to really spend the time with that resident and for the two of you to grow and develop and be successful together. Regional centers like to have these longitudinal residents because they, they learn more, they're more capable to do things. They, 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 they become a very capable set of hands around that hospital rather than someone who is there for a couple of weeks and soon they're on to another clinical placement. Right? So we think that our family physicians in our regional centers, we can really emphasize the quality of the experience they would have through some of these uh, longitudinal placements and the quality of experience they'll have with students who are quite intent like them about building that well-rounded experience but wanting to be part of the community. We have a a former uh, uh, ULETH student who's now a family physician in Tabor and uh, taking a student from USC as a resident starting just next week, I think. Uh, and when we had a chance to catch up with them at the, the Rural Initiative uh, Conference in the, in the spring, they love their experience. They love the variety of things that they got to see. They love the chance that they also got to coach volleyball and be a Boy Scout leader and several different things inside the community that they had time for, that they had access to, that that small space and that um, uh, structure let them do. They did recognize, I mean, family medicine has challenges too and they wanted some of those challenges addressed or met with and, and, and this is really our opportunity to help support that initiative. My name is Mark Edel. I think one of the problems with our system, the way it's set up now, is the great divide between the family physician and the hospital. My family physician knows my health history. If I end up in the hospital tomorrow, he or she cannot even go to the hospital to see how and what treatment I'm getting, the integrated treatment. So I'm just wondering, what will the relationship be between the new faculty and our hospital? Will the doctors at their hospital be offered joint appointmentships so that they could also be teaching? And if so, what's going to happen? They're already overloaded. They cannot, they don't have any time to be able to teach. If not, where are you going to find all the doctors to be teaching doctors when we can't even find doctors to be family doctors or the doctors are lacking in our hospital? So what's going to happen between this new faculty and our hospital? Thanks. It's, it's a great question, and I, I'm not going to claim to have all the answers for this one. It's a complicated situation. There are about 200 physicians in Lethbridge, or southern Alberta anyways, 
who are adjunct faculty members at University of Calgary. Right? So they already are a form of university professor. Many of them are, oh, Trushar's back. Many, many of them that we've had a chance to reach out to and, and sit down with, Trushar and I have gathered together with, with professionals for a beer, we've got together in more formal settings, we've done all kinds of things to start to feel, they're very interested about getting involved. AHS does have some programs for that. You can have a split clinical teaching appointment, you can do some other things there. Our, our relationship with the hospital, and Aaron Lowe is part of the, the SAMP group along with several other physicians from town. Uh, our relationship with the hospital right now is strong. They're, 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 they're also very encouraging. They, they, they want to have this resource in town. They want to have this kind of access. The exact details of, of what that connection would look like, as you point out, where would we find the time? How would we make that work? We've not arrived at that point yet, but the, the commitment is strong to find ways to make it work. And we do know, as I said, there are physicians in town who are interested in the educational process. We, we think the key for us, what, what's interesting for us is uh, connecting them to the U of L. Right? We also have obviously adjunct professor stream, visiting scholars and all kinds of things, but we haven't done a great job of, of connecting these colleagues, of bringing them and saying, hey, you bring some expertise, we have some expertise here on campus, there'd be some interesting things to, to do together. We do it in bits and pieces, but we have, it'd be, without the medical school, it has not been a priority for us. Now it will absolutely be a priority and we will find ways to make that connection, for sure. Great point. I'm not sure, this is pretty primitive technology at best, probably didn't come through. But Dr. Patel, who is a fantastic researcher himself, and this is why he uh, caught this note, wants me to emphasize the research component as well. Along with that interest in teaching, there are many physicians and many allied health professionals in town very interested in participating in research as well. And we think some of these connections, along with this space, along with this learner group, will really give us a chance to project that opportunity too. Bev Mendel Atherstone, thank you very much. I used to teach at Psych at the University of Lethbridge. Yeah. So congratulations on this great project. Um, yes, Lethbridge is a very supportive community and started the university. <clears throat> I'm glad to hear that you started in the neuropsych field here. You spoke about your hope for provincial application for proactive aspects based on the U of L research. But last week's SACPA speaker, Rob Sutherland in Neuropsych, and his colleagues in Neuropsych have done great research on Alzheimer's and dementia. But little has been taken up provincially, such as on his Alzheimer's research. Have you included in your application a guarantee from the province that the U of L research will be applied both into the proposed medical school curriculum and furthermore, that your research on prevention and public health, which you mentioned, be applied at the provincial level in a province so anti-research and anti-vaccination. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bev, for that question. Um, it, it, it is a shortcoming in traditional medical education, the amount of time that's spent talking about proactive actions and certainly exercise. And as I said, I, I, I spent my first 20 plus years in kinesiology and had many students from there and had a chance to catch up with lots of alum who've gone on to medical school. And some of whom were high level exercise. So I often say, you know, how, how many lectures, how much time did you spend learning about exercise as preventive medicine? It's, it's embarrassingly small in some traditional curriculums right now, right? At, at U of A at one point in time, it was four hours, right? Now that may have changed, this was a while ago, right? But four hours out of a four year program talking about exercise as a means for health, right? Is not enough, right? 
Uh, I haven't had a chance to inspect the three-year curriculum from U of C except to look at the parameters, which are problem-based learning and uh, both team learning and interprofessional. Uh, but I do, um, I, I do hope that there's more time spent on Proctor there. I do know looking from the subject categories and talking to colleagues at U of C that there's a strong recognition of the value of, of uh, proactive health. I think ULETH research has the same chance and opportunity to be, become part of uh, learning and, and expertise the way anyone else does. As you point out, we have fantastic researchers, Sutherland, well among them, right? And Sutherland's publications absolutely do form, uh, become part of uh, people's understanding and appreciation for science. And Sutherland's work at Alzheimer's, and I, I, I think, I haven't had a chance to, to hear Rob talk in a while, but when we last got together in the fall, he was also telling the same story, right? The, the, the interest, or the, the, the need in the, in the world of dementia is getting started early on that and understanding these various lifestyle factors that can come together, right, become part of this problem. And if we can start to make the lifestyle that doesn't pull in some of those factors early, research shows we can start to avoid some of those sort of things. So Sutherland's research absolutely is out there, as is Trouchard's and Wishaw's and, and, and Dr. De Bruin. There's a, there's a interesting little pat in the back in the world of research right now. There's an there's a email that you get when someone else cites one of your papers, comes from a specific group called, a name escapes me right now. And so just this morning, we, there were three more citations found for Dr. Nadler, Dr. De Bruin in my paper about walking with music with Parkinson's disease, right? So I know the research is getting out there. How long that takes to become a specific part of the curriculum is, is uh, a little uncertain, but the work is certainly getting out there. You know. Yeah, so uh, Trouchard wants to add then again, I mean, talking, coming back to the neuroscience pieces, these students' connections too and opportunities to access what we have at UofL also increases when we obviously have them on site too. They'll be able in the research opportunities to participate with a Sutherland, with a Wishaw, with a Patel in basic research, applied research, field work, qualitative studies, uh, interdisciplinary things that bring in our social science and humanities colleagues, all sorts of avenues. Hi, I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, I I'm worked here regionally. <laughs> I have five children that did one or more degrees at U of L. I was originally a family practitioner in rural Newfoundland, and I ended my career as a rural specialist in this area. Um, I have one child who left the province as a family practitioner that trained here. Uh, because of what was happening in Alberta. Uh, we have the problem that I went through, our family lost our family doctors. Uh, I can remember being interviewed by the assistant registrar over 40 years ago, and that person said, why would two young specialists want to go to Lethbridge? So it's not a new problem but we have to find some way to maintain your instructional component and not have them burn out as well as pay these people, particularly the rural practitioners. Um, Northern Ontario uh, School of Medicine seems to have managed keeping people. Yeah. Great, Ian. Thanks for, for contributing that. And you're, you're right. I mean, as we build things, we need to figure out how we maintain this instructional workforce. How will we find ways for them to thrive as part of University of Lethbridge, to be rewarded by that, uh, and, and to maintain that, that um, connection and opportunity, for sure. My name is Bob Campbell. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. 
Just a quick comment. Um, as an alumnus of the university, I'm happy to see that we're getting to where we are with this. That's exciting news. I also commend you for your research on Parkinson's disease because I know about that personally. Uh, quick comment. Uh, we received federal funding years ago, Dr. Judith Kulig, who used to be in health sciences, uh, for uh, doing work on health promotion within the area. And that was federal funding. Now, I'm not sure we could get that anymore according to the new government guidelines about, but I won't go down that road. Uh, so I have a very simple question. When will we be taking our first students? I'm checking to see if Dr. Patel is first and still there. Uh, I, I, I think the simple answer there is that, that we're in progress right now. The goal would be to have students in fall 2026, but it is an ambitious, a very ambitious goal. Uh, it will take a lot of work between now and then to make that happen, but it's, it's, it's something that we're pointing to and saying we're working towards that. Yeah, but it's it's we, we, we can't set in stone right now. There are a lot of of, of pieces to take care of, but we're we're working towards that. And to add to that, so the first component of the program is the Parkinson's disease program. Yeah. And Right. Yeah, that's a uh, great point. So uh, students in 2026 uh, in Lethbridge, again, a goal and a, and a high level goal that we're working towards, but not set in stone. But what we have started now is increasing the residency. So in fall 2024, there will be 10 uh, rural resident uh, placements, uh, and we're looking to expand that. So by the time those 2026 learners are in place for residency, an expanded number of rural residencies will be in place. So those will start in fall 2024. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, my name is Richard Tamkin. I have absolutely no medical knowledge whatsoever. But my concern is this. Your student qualifies, becomes a doctor, moves to Foremost, moves to Milk River. Where are they going to find their mental equals for some form of social life? Uh. I'm, I'm, it's, it's an important part of our, our existence, right, to be socially balanced, to have people who we feel are colleagues and compatriots, no doubt about it. I'm not prepared to say that those people don't exist in every corner of the world. Certainly those are smaller centers. I grew up in a small town myself. I grew up on the shore of Lake Erie in, in southern Ontario, uh, a little place between Port Stanley and St. Thomas called Lyndhurst. Uh, I, I've had no shortage of stimulating friends, colleagues as a youth, as a rambunctious high school student, as a undergraduate university student, or even when I return, return home now. So I, I'm confident that our learners will be uh, welcomed by the communities they get to. I'm confident that they will um, find enjoyment in the activities and the people that they interact with there. I, th I think that a number of them will come from that community, will come from that, or, or will come from similar areas as well and say, hey, you know, I understand what it is about work-life balance. I understand what the opportunities of, um, of existing in uh, uh, Prince George or uh, Milk River or uh, Blairmore or uh, Stetler are, and, and, and I, I, I think they're gonna have a, a wonderful way of life. Thank you very much, everyone, for good questions and good answers. Um, 
John, do you have any, uh, you already mentioned a take home message, but could you expand on your take home message for this sure. group yeah. of young people here? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Knut, and thanks again, everyone, for coming today. Uh, I, I think um, for those of you who remember uh, the former president of U of L, Bill Cade, uh, a dynamic figure and, and, and someone who I really looked up to in my early time there, uh, and, and still when I uh, have this rare chance to see him now, he always liked to end a talk by saying, "Stay tuned," right? And uh, I would say the same thing here. As I said, we're in progress. Uh, you, you can, I hope, sense the investment. Uh, Dr. Patel calling in from Montreal just to keep me on my toes is uh, certainly a good indication right, that we have at U of L, at U of C, at the provincial level, across the community, um, at the national level. The way we were welcomed at uh, McMaster satellite campuses in Niagara and Waterloo last week was wonderful. Right? We have a, a ton of investment here and we have a ton of support. We're definitely in progress. We're looking forward to uh, uh, moving this forward, and, and, and we're happy to have you all interested and involved. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you next Thursday, uh, and we will talk about what you should be eating in order to maximize your brain activity. <laughs> <laughs>